guys sound awesome here tonight. Let's turn our Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Hope you're excited again to the Word of God here tonight. And I believe we have a message from the Lord here that will start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 18. And give me a solid amen once you're there. And we're going to wait. <laughs> Want to make sure you can follow along. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 18. If you don't got a Bible, the person next to you does. If they don't, then amen. Sad story. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. Give me an amen once you're there. Awesome. The Bible says, For the message of the cross is foolishness. To those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where's the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And the campus evil said, Amen. Over here, the Bible says to those who are perishing, those who don't choose to believe in the words of God, those who don't choose to follow Christ, they say this message, this theology, this message of Christ coming down from heaven to earth to die for our sins it's foolishness. They scoff at it. They jeer at it. They make fun of it. And they think it's absolutely silly. The message may be foolish to those because they think the Bible is outdated and does not apply to them. But they fail to realize the Bible is alive and active. And it deals with the heart of men and women. And the hearts of men and women for all time has not changed. They think it's foolish because they feel that wealth and status erases the feel and the need for God and his glory. But they fail to realize that it's all vanity. And one day we will have to give an account to God for what we did and what we did not do. They say it's foolish because people love their sin more than God. And they fail to realize sin is destroying their lives. And they're only trying to fill a God-sized whole heart with things that cannot fill it. And yet they say it's foolish. You know, in a thesaurus, there's many synonymous words for foolishness. One is simpleton. The other is adult. A blockhead. A numb school. This is my favorite one. An ignoramus. A dunderhead or a nincompoop. This is what the world thinks of disciples. But to God, they are fools. Now, the Bible talks about many different fools. Psalm 14 verse 1 says about the atheistic fool. Luke 12 verse 13 says the materialistic fool. Proverbs 12, verse 1 talks about the stupid fool. Matthew 7 talks about the fool that doesn't listen to God. Or in other words, the practical atheist. But here tonight, I'm not here to talk about the atheistic fool, or the stupid fool, or the materialistic fool, or the fool that doesn't listen to God. I'm here to talk about being a fool for Christ. And that's the title of the lesson here tonight, Fools for Christ. It was once said, everyone's going to be a fool for something. And the question here tonight, whose fool are we going to be? 
y'all's thinking as we're about to go into our semesters and our quarters, as Santa Monica's about to start, as USC's about to start, as all these different campuses about to start, what does the campus ministry need to hear? And I just couldn't help but think about being a fool for Christ. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 10, it's already hot up here. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 10. The Bible says, We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, and we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. Here is the Apostle Paul speaking. And he's saying to the church in Corinth that we are fools in Christ. And he says that to the earth, we become the scum of the earth or the garbage of this world. Can you imagine telling your family that what you want to be when you grow up? I want to be the scum of the earth. I want to be the garbage of the world. It's like, what are you talking about? That's, I thought you wanted to be a doctor, an engineer. But the Bible says that's how the world sees this room. What are you doing on a Friday night? Sacrificing your time to worship God. What are you doing running wild on your campus? Sharing your faith with those people who said no over and over and over again. What are you doing giving up your dreams to do the dreams of God? But we know in this room we decide that we want to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we want to be fools for the Lord. You know, I remember telling my parents that I wanted to give up being an engineer to be in the full-time ministry. And they looked at me like I was a fool. They said, you have a job offer to work for NASA. What are you doing? Going to pay, make some chicken change doing the ministry. But I understand that it just wasn't something that I wanted to do. This was a calling of God. And I believe as we go to our campuses, we got to have this conviction that you are called by God to be an ambassador of Christ in your respective campus. That God wants you to run around there like a fool. Because fools don't care what people think about them. Fools don't care about the status quo. Fools don't care about what people say. They are just concerned about pleasing their God. I got a couple points for us. We're going to study out a couple fools here tonight. We're going to study out the fools over there in the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Point number one, fools don't shut up. Acts 4 in verse 5. Fools don't shut up. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to be a fool tonight. I'm going to get away with my foolishness here tonight. Acts chapter 4. So we understand that the book of Acts starts in 29 AD. Acts 2 is the day of Pentecost. That day, the first time the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection was preached. And then 3,000 people were baptized that day. And it became a sweeping movement that sparked all throughout the first century. And they evangelized the world in one generation. And yet, through their time, there's so much persecution. And we see in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they heal a lame man. And because they heal a lame man are teaching and preaching in Jerusalem, they get thrown into jail. And it's amazing to see these men's hearts for God, that even though they were persecuted, they still did not stop. Let's pick up the reading, Acts chapter 4, in verse 5. It says in verse 5, The next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest family. 
they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. And this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, some fools, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, me, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Fools never shut up. It's amazing here that Peter and John They are threatened with persecution. And the people want to throw them into jail. But they could not deny the miracles that these men did. And it's amazing to see that once they saw the persecution, Peter and John did not draw back. That when they saw that they were being persecuted, they said that which one should we listen to? Who should we listen to? God or you? And the command that they gave them was to stop speaking. Stop sharing your faith. Stop going out there and helping people getting their life right with God. And they simply said, we cannot. Just think about this. Just imagine, put, put yourself in these men's shoes. You are with people that could kill you. People that could murder you. These were the people who led the nation at that time. And yet, because they were so in love with Jesus, they could not help but to continue to preach the word of God. You see, what drove these men was love. What drove them to not help but talk about Jesus was they simply loved Christ so much. When you love something, you can't help but talk about it. It doesn't matter. I remember when, when I started pursuing Regine, I was a, I was, I was a fool. You, when, when you're in love, you do some foolish things. I mean, I became an artist. Uh, I, I, I drew some, you know, nice little encouragement cards. And she lived all the way in New York, so I had to, I had to mail it to her. So I went to the post office and mailed her some encouragement cards. And I looked for her favorite snack, which was chocolate-covered pretzels. And for whatever reason, I couldn't find these pretzels anywhere. So I went from Target to CVS to Target, and finally I found those pretzels. And I was like, man, she's going to be fired up about these pretzels. And I shipped it on over. See, when, when when you're in love, you become a fool. And despite them trying to stop Peter and John, they said, no, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep preaching the word of God. And I believe it's time for us to be those type of fools. That people are going to try to stop us. They're going to jeer at us. They're going to laugh at us. I remember even the other day, I was sharing my faith at USC. Some guy got right in my face and just said, no. And just walked away. I was like, all right. <laughs> I, I like, right, yeah, they get up. He got like right here to my face. Like, dude, like, it, 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 and J- Jacob was there. He saw it. 
And I was like, man, well, why, why do you guys say it like that, bro? You know? <laughs> but right now, we got to have this fire in our hearts. And it comes from what it says right here. It says they're filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, when you get baptized, you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. But just because you get that gift doesn't make you spiritual. Come on, bro. So when they were filled with the Spirit, they preached the Word of God boldly. That is what we need right now in our campus to never let down, never shut up, and be fools for Christ. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, you have to turn, the Bible says, But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Is that how you feel when you share faith? You can't help but talk about Jesus. You can't help but say, this man healed me. That this man saved my life. This man saved my soul. That he's not just a man, but he is God in the flesh. You can't help but preach about the word of God. That's what's needed. Imagine. Every disciple yeah. at UCLA, Santa Monica, DH, Elko, and USC. Filled with the Spirit. Not caring what the people say. Not caring what your classmates say. Yeah. Not caring what your teammates say. Not caring what your yeah. teachers may say. Not caring what your strangers may say. Just being fools in love. On, fools that just never shut up. Yeah. That just keep going, never stop talking and sharing their faith. That's how they were in the book of Acts. And if you're a guest here tonight, that's what we're trying to restore. We're not just trying to have a cute little campus ministry over there at USC or UCLA. We're not trying to have something that a little kumbaya moment and just go sing and do some s'mores and you know, not really do much of anything that God wants us to do. We're trying to turn the world upside down. We're not just trying to share our faith over there at UC, UCLA and UNC. We're trying to turn it upside down. We're trying to start a revolution, and I believe I'm looking at the revolutionaries that are going to do it for the Lord. I, growing up, I never heard anything like that. I, I didn't, going to church was just a meeting. It wasn't about starting a revolution. I never even had the concept of sharing my faith. What even meant to go make a disciple? But then finally someone came to me, and they gave me that fire. But then now I know that God wants me to go spread the fire. You know, I want to lift up the whole USC campus ministry. Um, we, do, we do start next week, and we're fired up, and we're fired up for Santa Monica to start, and Elko, and DH, and all the other schools. But we got persecuted heavily this past semester. So heavily that they renounced our club status on campus. And it's amazing because we understand that's exactly what happened in the book of Acts in our modern vernacular. Where they just told us, please stop sharing your faith. Enough's enough. That people are, are sick of it. But we had the same moment over here in Acts 4 with them. We said, who should we listen to? Should we listen to you? Or should we listen to God? Now, does God want, I even told the people there, the religious leaders, I told them, does God want us to share our faith? They said, yes. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go share our faith with the Lord because that's what God wants us to do. And it's amazing to see all the students and all the campus workers there not back down. Not back down, but just go even more. And that's what we need right now. A fire in our bones. That we're not just sharing our faith, we're sharing our faith. We're sharing our faith with faith. We're sharing our faith with love. We're sharing our faith with fire. Because we know that the world is burning. And we gotta fight fire with fire. You know, in 2019, at USC, a 21-year-old male who belonged to a fraternity, a 21-year-old male who majored in cinematic arts, and a 27-year-old male grad student 
all committed suicide. One other student that same year made a decision to walk across the 110 freeway and got hit by two cars and committed suicide. This is the depression, the anxiety, the things that people are going through on our campus. And I can relate because I've been there myself where I've had suicidal thoughts as a campus student. We just get to a point where is life even worth living? What if a disciple just shared their faith with one of these people? What if a disciple got to them and said, you don't have to live a life like this anymore? That's why we got to go to our campuses and share like never before. We're not just trying to fill a quota. We're not just trying to make ourselves look good. We understand that people are lost. Just like how Peter and John, they healed a lame man. Spiritually right now, there's many people begging for God right now. And they don't even know it. But they're frustrated, waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed to them. And I believe tonight, I'm looking at a group of men and women who are going to be those people that are going to reveal themselves to them. They're going to see us on our campuses, and we're going to remind them of Jesus. They're going to see us on our campuses, bold as our Lord. They're going to see us on our campuses, having the faith the conviction, the love, and the endurance to say that God's still alive. God still reigns. You can be reconciled with God here in this year. I just want to simply challenge us. Right now is just time to put in old, good old-fashioned hard work. We, we want to see many souls be one for God's glory. These men just never stop sharing their faith. And that's why they were able to win the world for God in one generation. Don't forget the dream. Don't forget your mission. You're not just a student over there at USC. You're not just a student over there at UCLA. You're not a student, at, you're not just a, 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 a worker. You are an ambassador of Christ. You are just like Peter and John. You, are, you have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead living inside of you. How much faith and confidence should that breed? Let's go out and be the fools that never stop sharing their faith. Point number two, fools are radical. Let's go to Acts chapter eight. In Acts eight, we're introduced to a man named Philip. Now, we understand that most commentators believe from Acts 1 to Acts chapter 8. Yeah, I love the little ad-libs here. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, from Acts 1 to Acts 8, uh, there's a one-year span. And it's amazing to see that the forceful advancement that was happening, you see in Acts 4 that the church got to 5,000 men, just the men. Can you imagine seeing 5,000 men over here in the City of Angels? Or 5,000 men just here in the Metro Coast? And it was just confided to Jerusalem. Then what happens? There's a great persecution. That was incited by Saul, who later became Paul. And because of the persecution in Jerusalem, they get scattered all around the world. And let's see what our man Philip did. In Acts 8, verse 1. Point number two, fools are radical. The Bible says, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to his city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Wow. All right, so it's amazing here. We understand that all the 12 apostles stayed in Jerusalem. 
because it was a command of God and during in Acts chapter 1 he says don't leave Jerusalem and it kept that as the mother church so everyone else then was scattered that will be like all the region leaders staying over here in LA then all every single one of everyone else of the church goes out and plants other mission teams and Jason and all the and all regionally have to stay over here in LA and what's amazing here we see the conviction of, of Philip where he goes and everyone else wherever they go they continue being those fools and they're sharing their faith wherever they went now we live in a time where people want to come to church and just hear their pastor preach and they pay him to do their Christianity but in the first century, everyone was a participator in saving the world. And that's what we believe as well as sold out disciples of Jesus. And it says that Philip was a one-man mission team. The guy is in a city by himself. No Bible talk. The only disciple there. And he gets radical he's radical and he says the bible says that he brings great joy to that city what can one disciple do with god bring joy to a whole city only if they will be radical so who is this man philip well we understand in acts chapter 6 there was an issue in the church where the church started to grow, and when the church starts to grow, there will be more issues. So as we grow, there's going to be more issues that are going to come in the church or in the campus ministry. So they saw that there were women in the church that were being overlooked, and they were not being fed. So the apostles decided to raise up seven men, where the Bible says to be known, th that they were known to be filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And these men were the men that were raised up to take care of these women. And Philip was one of those guys. Now, what's amazing about this is we understand, as I said earlier, that from Acts 1 to Acts 8, the church only been around for about a year. That means most likely Philip was only a year or less spiritually. That he was not a man who's been around. He was probably around maybe for a couple months. A couple months old spiritually. Able to bring joy to a whole city. He said, I don't need my discipler. I don't need my region leader. I don't need whoever. I can just go out and preach the word of God. Why is that? Because it says he was filled with the spirit and filled with wisdom. Filled with wisdom. Right now, we were in a time where all of us could be filled with wisdom as we go through first principles. And it's a time for us to strive to become radical because with radical knowledge, you get radical power. There's great knowledge in the word of God that then breeds into the power of the Holy Spirit. So if every one of us crack down and get knowledgeable in the word, this is how we're going to be those radical fools. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Let's take a brief tangent here. Fools are radical. Hebrews 5 and verse 11. How do we get radical? Well, I believe it's getting into the word of God. And getting confident in the knowledge of Christ. Hebrews 5 verse 11, the Bible says, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have distinguished themselves from evil. Distinguished good from evil. Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying, in the, laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. Instruction about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. Let's stop right there. So we understand this is a passage in the book of Hebrews. It was written around 64 AD. And this is a time where 
uh, the Hebrew writer is addressing many Christians who were no longer trying to understand the first principles. The main thesis of the book is understanding that how the covenant of Christianity is greater than the old covenant of Judaism. And they wanted to go back to being a Jew because of the mass persecution that was happening as we just read over there in Acts chapter 8. And the reason why was they didn't understand this idea of a high priest. And they thought that we need a high priest to get our sins forgiven. Because in the Jewish covenant, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, as we all know. And then he would sacrifice different animals. And they had to get in contact with that blood to get their sins forgiven. So church back then would be a very bloody scene because they need to get their sins forgiven by getting in contact with the blood of animals. Thank God we're no longer under that covenant. But then what happens is the Hebrew writer says, well, Jesus Christ is now our high priest. We no longer need a high priest like that. But then he takes a brief tangent over here in verse 11 and says, I could go on and on about this, but you guys should be able to teach this yourself. And goes into six fundamental principles about faith in God, resurrection of the dead, laying on hands, baptism, eternal judgment, and God permitting we will do so. And he's saying that we should be able to teach these things. And I believe right now is the time for us to get radical in our knowledge. That you're going to go up to many smart individuals over there on campus, and they're going to challenge your faith. And we have to be able to defend the gospel. And I believe right now, the first principles time, it's a great time to take advantage of this so we can get radical. And this scripture says someone who's mature is someone who, that can teach. In our vernacular, that's a Bible talk leader. Philip became a Bible talk leader in months. People ask, well, how long does it take to become a Bible talk leader? Well, it depends on you. On how long does it take you to become a mature Christian so that you can teach non-Christians the first principles of Christianity. And what's amazing about this is that we understand if, wow, if we saw a little child not grow for years. Can you imagine if you saw Mickey and, or Monty? The, the Demetrius kids, and they were the same size in 10 years. Or even the same size in a year. That's going to be very concerning. But we know as human beings, we're doomed to grow. That all of us were babies and we grew up to adults. But as Christians, you're not doomed to grow. It's your decision. You could be a four-month dis old disciple and be mature. You could be a four-year-old disciple and still be immature. But it's up to you. And I believe I'm looking at very smart individuals in this room. I believe in you guys. You guys are smart. You guys are important. God loves you. I, 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 I know you guys could do this. But if we want to see God grow the church, if we want to see more souls come into the campus ministry, we need more Bible talk leaders over here in the Metro Coast. Who's ready to step up and become a Bible talk leader this year? You know, I, I, I remember when I got baptized uh, right over there in the East Bay. I guess not. It was around where Tori's at, actually. I, I was living over there in San Ramon. Someone reached out to me while I was doing an engineering internship. And I got baptized, thank God for Christian Enos, who leads our church in Salt Lake City. And, and quickly, as I, as I saw the, the church, it seemed like, wow, like I, I need to step up and do some leading. And I was very reluctant. I was a guy sitting all the way in the back with, with a hood on, not wanting to do anything. Because uh, I, was, I was afraid. I, di I didn't want to step up because I was a fail, fail, failure. But I knew that, man, I got, we, I got to become a Bible talk leader. So I was the only campus student over there at UC Merced. And I met a young lady here who went to UC Merced, so go Bobcats, amen. <laughs> and I was there, and I was like, man, you know what? I'm the only campus student here. I read that passage in Acts 8. Well, Philip was the only guy in Samaria. And he was able to start a radical movement of God in one city. So I was inspired. I was like, hey, man, let's go. I'll say LMU. 
I was, I was inspired, like, man, I got to start a Bible talk here. So I was one month old spiritually. And we started a Bible talk. When I say we, it was me and the Holy Spirit. Over there, you see my son? First day, we had nine guests. I was like, hey, man, this is awesome. And they were fired up. And I was like, you know what? Let's do it again next week. The next week, we had 12 guests. I'm like, hey, man, that's awesome. And they're like, all right, guys, invite your friends. I went on the UC Merced Classified, put an event on and said, hey, guys, we're going to have a Bible discussion here on campus. Everyone was like thinking, I was like this big Bible nerd. I was like, what's this guy doing? A Bible discussion on campus? It's weird. But then the next week, we had 16 people come to Bible dis discussion. And many of them studied the Bible. Many of them, a lot of them got up to far in the studies, but no one got baptized. But what it did teach me was how to just be radical. I can confidently say at first I was afraid of what people were going to think about me or what, what would they say. I was even afraid, what am I going to say at the Bible talk? One month old spiritually, all I did was imitate my leader at the time and just did the Bible talk that he did and I laid over there on campus. But what it did give me was grit. Grit and a radical faith that one man could change a whole campus. What can you do on your campus? Yeah. It's time for all of us to get radical. And I really want to encourage the students who are actually enrolled on these campuses to become radical. On, Don't be afraid. Be bold and courageous. Yeah. You have the Holy Spirit. Yes. You are the most intelligent person on that campus. Right. You are the most powerful person on that campus. Yeah. You know the truth. Bring the wise men, bring the engineer, bring the philosopher, bring anyone. You know the truth of Christ. They might think you're a fool, but they're a fool because you are radical for God. I, I want to challenge us here. It's time to get mature. It's time to get mature. We're going to have some new baby brothers here this Sunday with Christian and Kobe over there. Amen. So when someone gets baptized, now they're the baby brother or baby sister. So if you were baptized before then, you're no longer the baby. So Elijah got baptized last week. You're not the baby no more, brother. <laughs> that was time for everyone who was baptized this year to get radical, to become mature. It's up to you how much you're going to apply yourself. And I believe that this room can get radical. And I believe what we saw in the first half of the year is only a preview of what God wants to do in the second half. Yeah. And if we will be like the brothers and sisters in the book of Acts, be true fools, fools that are radical, we're going to see radical things that God's going to do. Point number three, and our last point, fools are persistent. Let's go to Acts 26. Acts chapter 26. We're now going to see the words of Paul. Fools are persistent. So, Paul over here is on his way to Rome. Before then, he has some stops to make. And he's able to speak to many powerful leaders. People like Festus and Felix who all held government positions over there. And finally he gets to the king of the Jews during the time, King Agrippa. And he's able to share his testimony with them. And what a powerful testimony Saul has. A man who murdered Christians, himself was the greatest persecutor of the time. And then Christ comes down himself and blinds him for three days. Bless you. And he gets converted and becomes a disciple of Jesus Christ. And becomes, arguably, the most influential Christian of all time. He gets a chance to share his faith. And talks about the vision that God gave him. And he says about this vision in Acts 26 verse 19. Talking to King Agrippa, the words of Paul. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Isn't that so powerful there? He says, I was not disobedient. What vision is God giving you? And are you being obedient? 
Verse 20. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seize me in the temple courts and try to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind. You're a fool, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not as sane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long. I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. Bulls are persistent. What a powerful scene we hear, we see here with our brother Paul. Sharing his faith with one of the most powerful men of the time, King Agrippa. And he shares his testimony, and then one of the other leaders interrupt him and says, you're insane. You're a fool. And he's got to love Paul's boldness. He just says, dude, I'm, I'm in my right mind. You're the one that's kind of crazy. You're the one tripping. I, I know the truth here. What, this is true, and this is reasonable. And then Agrippa says, are you trying to convert me with this testimony? Are you trying to make me into a Christian? Do you want me to, to become a disciple? And Paul says, short time or long, I want everyone that's hearing these words to become just like me. In other words, a disciple, except for these chains. You see, Paul was persistent. If you read the book of Acts, he knew he had a goal. He wanted to go to Rome and share his faith with the most powerful people there. And it took years, but he did it. But then he got beheaded for it. You see, for us, as we go into our campuses, as we're going into this next half of the year, it's going to take so much persistence. It's going to take so much endurance. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. Just, just read the book of Acts. You ever read the book? You've got to stay out the book of Acts. You see, these men, these men were radical men and radical women. Don't forget about the sisters. The sisters were radical too. And they just did not quit. They got stoned, thrown to jail, flogged. I mean, that's not a lot worse than someone saying no in your face or someone cursing you out. Imagine being flogged for your faith. And yet, Paul was still persistent with the forehead of flint. Where does persistence come from? It comes from prayer. Luke 18, we have time to go there, but you can talk, you can look at the persistent widow. Genesis 32, you can look at Jacob wrestling with God, which I believe is a physical illustration of prayer. Who are we going to be praying for right now? Maybe some people that we share with six months ago maybe someone they had a they had a a, 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 a a lightning summer where they finally see that they need god who can we pray for right now be persistent who can we follow up with you see sharing is obedience but following up is love we show we really love people when we follow up with them and that's what's needed right now a radical persistence you know, Ezekiel 3, verse 7, you have to turn there. But the Bible talks about Ezekiel going to God's people to preach to them. And it says that the people of Israel were not willing to listen because their hearts were hard and that they were obstinate. But then God says to Ezekiel, I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. 
Don't be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. That's what we need right now. That needs to be our conviction. A forehead of flint. Flint at that time was the hardest stone that they knew. And God tells Ezekiel that you're about to go to a people whose hearts are hard. Who, and they're obstinate. But I've called you. And I'm going to make you more unyielding than them. You see, as a disciple of Jesus, we're incredibly stubborn people. And we're stubborn for good things. We're stubborn for God. We're persistent. Because we know that God's coming back one day. And when he comes back, the question is, is he going to find faith? And I believe in the Metro Coast, in every single campus, whether it be UCLA, whether it be Santa Monica, whether it be DH, Elko, or USC, or LMU. God will find faith because he's going to find persistent, radical fools for himself. You know, it's amazing to see all the people who've been baptized this year. And some, it was short time or long. I remember when my wife studied with TJ over there. And it was a miraculous time. It was our first service as a, as a region, Christmas Eve. I believe she did her word, her word study on that Monday and got baptized that Sunday. Some took a little longer. But they're faithful, radical disciples. And I think of the UCLA sisters when I think about persistent women for God. And I can't help but think about the baptism of Chalcodyne over there. <laughs> well, amen. Took some time. But now Chalcodyne is a sold out, powerful disciple of Jesus Christ because the sisters did not give up. They were persistent. They were radical. Fool for God. Now, who are we going to be a fool for this semester? It's time to get persistent. It's time to have that forward effect. Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. We got to shake the dust off our foot when God calls us to do that. But we got to radically follow up with people. And show them the love of God. You now we have some goals as a campus ministry. And we believe these goals is what God wants us to do for his glory. It's not about us. It's about giving God glory. Imagine seeing 55 campus baptisms just here in the Metro Coast. That's the goal. And I'm praying that every single one of them stay faithful. And I want you to join me in that prayer. Amen. Write it down right now on a piece of paper in your phone. 55. Let's pray radically. Let's be persistent. Let's beg God. Because every single one of those numbers, they're a soul. Right. And at some point, every single one of us was one of those numbers yeah. that someone prayed about. They were persistent. Christian was so persistent with me. I tried to blow him off so many times. I told him, yeah, man, like, you're, you're kind of cutting out in my gym time here. I'm sorry. I, I'm, this, is, this is after the discipleship study. <laughs> Amen. Thanks for judging me, bro. But, but, but I was like, man, I, but th th then I got, I got with him. And it's like, bro, you know you're lost. Like, yeah, you're right. Okay, I got I, Let's study every day, man. <laughs> But he was persistent. I tried to miss midweek, and, he, and, he, and I was like, yeah, bro, I can't make it. Then he texts me, why, with like, like 10 whys after the why. Then I was like, man, this guy wants me to go to church so bad. Jeez, man. But he was persistent. And now I'm here. And I'm grateful that God put a man in my life that was persistent, and now my soul is saved. I believe in closing, if we want to see... The amazing things that God wants to do here. We got to have a nevertheless attitude. An attitude that does not back down. Let's close out in Acts chapter 5.
what do we want to show people on our campuses? As we studied out some of the fools in Acts, I hope we're ready to be like those fools. In Acts 5, in verse 38, this is what I hope will be the anthem of our hearts as we leave tonight. We hear about the disciples of Jesus in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 38. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. We want to show people that there is a God on our campuses. That there's a God all around the West. There's a God all around the Southland living in our campuses. So let's make a decision. Let's be those fools that never shut up. Let's be those fools that stay radical. And let's be those fools that never give up. Let's be fools for Christ and to God be the glory.